Hey everyone, and welcome to the do notation lesson. So far, all the explanation we have done is a bit abstract. And really, the concept of monads is an abstract concept. Now, we will see how this whole mountain we have climbed will now allow us to do some things easily. So, let's talk about the do notation. First of all, the do notation is what is called a syntactic sugar. In this case, to facilitate the use of monads. A syntactic sugar in a programming language means some construction which makes things easier to write without adding complexity to the language. Actually, it's a bit of magic to make things simpler sweeter and nicer to be used, in this case, by programmers. What we will see is that with this do notation, the functional code that we'll write will seem and look like imperative code with assignments. Here it is important to note, and it shall be noted, that this only is a look like, is a seeming event. Okay, the functional code seems and looks like it won't be a imperative code. Okay, we won't have imperative code. We will have functional code that will look like, that's important, it will only look like a imperative code. So what you have below, you have to read column by column. First we have here the first column, and then after we have the second column. So one way of thinking this do notation and to understand this do notation is to transport it to what we know of Haskell notation without the do. In fact, uh, something interesting to know and very interesting is that originally when Haskell was created, the do notation uh, did not exist. It was later then when they developed monads and then after, it was when they introduced the do notation. So the idea of the do notation is that we can sequence operations. When we write do and between braces, c1 semicolon c2, it means that we will first do c1 and then we will do c2. Now keep in mind that this uh, concept of to sequence a series of computations or operations is a concept that is out of this functional programming world. Since in functional programming, we do not know when the operations are performed. And even more, we have no way of saying do this before that. Or so it seems until now. Now this sequence process is necessary since if we want to read a number and then write its square, we cannot do this on a reversed order. We can't uh, compute first the square value of a number that we haven't read before. So then this notation like this in braces uh, is equivalent to write a do and then under write the two computations. Or if we have more computations, then we just write all the computations on different lines. Now, what does this do C1, C2 mean? Well, this is a given end to apply C1 with the bind operator without the equal C2. This is what we have referred to be syntactic sugar. This do and this do. This first option or this second one is equivalent to this bind operation. And while this here has the syntax of and also the form of a imperative instructions. Here we have the functional form. And moreover, you also know that this operator, it means nothing but the same as the bind that has the equal in here, discarding the parameter that will be passed to it. That is constant function C2. In some way, this already conveys to us the idea that C1, C2 is a sequencing where C1 will be done first and then after the result that had C1 will be passed as a parameter 
to carry out C2. And this parameter will be ignored since we have here a lambda function and we will do C2. But in some way, this function that you have here has to work with this argument, with this parameter. And this parameter has to be the result of C1, of the computation 1. Therefore, in this way, we will ensure that C1 is performed before C2. But many times, not only do we need things to be done one before the other, but we also need information to be transferred. In order to do this, we use this arrow notation. If we write do, and then x takes the value c1, and then c2, this is equivalent as writing the same without the braces and the semicolons. To write the do, to indent, x takes the value c1, and then on the next line, I write c2. In fact, people that work with Haskell do not say this instruction, x takes the value c1, because it is not an assignment either. But it's also called, between the workers and programmers of Haskell, they call it a binding. Because we tie the result of C1 to X. And this here, in functional notation that we already know, is by definition equivalent to this here. So, if you take C1 and you pass here this result, that will be an X, you pass it through the function C2. That is, C2 is a function that return something when you pass it a argument and this argument is the one that c1 has later we will go beyond but if now you think on the case of input and output here we could say uh, give me a number and then we will write its square to write the square what we do is to apply the function that waits for obtained by the computation c1 that is for reading and then it writes its square on the computation c2 very well with this we end the first lesson on do notation on the next lesson we will see some examples